America has always been uncomfortable with an ugly reality, the prospect of war. But in the face of deadly weapons, economic instability, and terrorism, the immediacy of maintaining national security continues to be the major challenge faced by almost every nation in the world. In an age of push-button solutions, there is a misperception that technology alone will bring victory in war, and that battles will be fought at distance without huge loss of life or the physical destruction that war inevitably brings. But warfare requires putting soldiers on the battlefield, where a bullet has no political affiliation, and victory is measured by living or dying. The battlefield is everywhere. One military unit that is continually preparing for combat are the U.S. Navy SEALs. It might be rescuing prisoners from terrorists, gathering intelligence on enemy troop movements, or destroying a target with an airstrike. Such missions are called direct action. With over 60 years of operating from sea, air, and land, U.S. Navy SEALs measure their success and failures in blood, self-sacrifice, and a ruthless determination to win. The SEAL sniper team is attempting to enter an urban area occupied by hostile forces. Their mission is to locate and rescue a captured American soldier being held hostage. The sniper and his spotter fear only one thing more than death or capture, failing their mission. In Naval Special Warfare, you have an exceptionally highly motivated individual who is a risk taker. Somebody is going to go out there take on the biggest challenge that you have, and oh, by the way, they're going to succeed because they don't have the word failure in their vocabulary. Inside the deserted town, the enemy could be anywhere. This is not a situation for hope and enthusiasm. The sniper team's time on target is limited. on the challenge. And when there are things going on in the world, they want to be the first one there. That's what we live for. You know, the cream rises to the top. These guys all want to be the cream. seeing one of their friends nearly torn in two by a 50 caliber round traveling at that velocity. We shoot multi-purpose rounds that do explode on impact on steel and on humans. And every time they hear a muzzle crack, one of their friends goes down, that's enough for them. U.S. Navy SEALs are a military unit that constantly trains for war in every part of the world. What distinguishes them from other U.S. Special Forces units is their ability to operate in water. When that SEAL goes into combat, they're not out there with a fleet to support them. There's no room for error. You need to make sure that that individual who's standing on your left or on your right is going to be there before and after the bullets start flying. When compared to Mach 3 fighter planes and computer technology, SEALs may appear obsolete, a romantic throwback to the ancient warrior. 
But even in this age of high technology, combat is often a trial of strength and will, decided by emotion. SEALs maintain a solid connection to their traditions of combat, adapting to circumstances, innovation in tactics, and a savage dedication to win in wartime. A SEAL is a guy who is willing to do whatever's necessary to get the job done. What makes SEALs different than other conventional forces and other forces throughout the world is we all share a common bond. The Bud's training, the Hell Week, all that stuff, it is still the core of what we are. Now our philosophy is that that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And when these young men have to go out and perform their mission in the SEAL team, they push the envelope. And what we try to do is provide demanding training that builds their confidence, that builds their spirit, but also, too, keeps them safe. Getting to the operational teams takes over a year for any man willing to pay the price of buds. So good. On the side, on the side, portal. Basic on underwater side. demolition SEAL training is a back-breaking course that separates the dedicated from the ordinary. Catch that man in front of you. Portal, you're gonna have to put out. For six months, pass. a student is put through tedious, demanding training to filter out those who have the dream but not the desire. The people that go through this course may be involved in conflict, and I would take it very personal that if we had to pass somebody out of here that wasn't ready to meet that, those objectives, I would take it as a failure on my part. We're taking your time, move. Individual attention is one of the primary motivation techniques instructors will use to push a man to succeed. Get on the line, don't wait. Don't save anything. Cordell, you stop now. Everything you've done up to this point doesn't mean a thing. Yeah. Well, then move. Eventually, One each side, student is closely ten. scrutinized by instructors who probe Three for weakness. Run, each week, performance times must improve or the student is dismissed. You gotta move. One movement. Can you fall? I had trouble making every run. In first phase, you gotta run four miles in 32 minutes. A lot of people are going, well, that's no big deal. Well, it's in the soft sand with jungle boots on. I puked at the end of every run. Regardless, I puked. I did not pass a run until Hell Week, and they said, this is your last chance. You gotta pass this run or you're gone. You're gonna have to hit the ground sprinting. You're almost out of time, Cordell. Hit the ground, you hit it. Yes, sprint! Bud's kinda gives you the will. No matter what, what's happening to you, you're gonna win. Ours is a unique school, and that's what makes us who we are. Without that school, we'd probably be just like anybody else. Keep going. And oh, eight. Keep going, don't stop, Morris Devilman. 10.08. John. That was his time. He had to make a 10.08 to pass. Or under 11. It's a phenomenon. You can only see this here at Bud's. Shut over, sir. Ready? The lessons learned at Bud's are part of a legacy. One that dates back over 50 years to the beaches of World War II and the celebrated underwater demolition teams. Underwater demolition units began to train in 1943 for both Atlantic and Pacific invasion duty. The UDT mission was simple. They were responsible for charting beaches and destroying obstacles that hampered amphibious landings. But their methods were primitive. They prided themselves on their ability to hold their breath. They didn't have any uh, big tanks of air. Some of them didn't have face masks, and it was not until late in the war that they even had swim fins. They just went in there with a pair of shorts and did the best they could, towing inflated bags carrying explosives, which they put on these underwater obstacles and, and blew them away. When Korea exploded in 1950, UDT frogmen expanded their operations. For the first time, they performed missions inland, setting the precedent for a war that would change everything. Vietnam, 1964. Vietnam was an unconventional war and demanded an unconventional response team, one that could successfully navigate the waterways and coastlines of the country. The Navy's UDT swimmers were a natural choice. 
In the leech-infested waters of Vietnam, the frogmen were transformed. They became Navy SEALs. We, the Navy SEALs, went there to win the hearts and minds of anybody. We were there to kick the ass out of the enemy. We were there to destroy him. We were there to shoot the bastard. We were there to destroy his camps. We weren't there to worry about what the next door neighbor thought about us. We were there to do a job. Throughout the Mekong Delta, Navy SEAL platoons were creating serious disruptions in the Viet Cong political infrastructure. Tax collectors and high-ranking Viet Cong and NBA officials were the preferred target. Operating at night, often dressed up like the VC, SEAL squads of two to seven men kidnapped, ambushed, and infiltrated their enemy's camps. The Viet Cong called them the men with green faces. Their commandos would come out at night. Sometimes they were dropped in by helicopters deep into our areas, and they would remain there for a long time. There were a lot of these blue and green faced soldiers all around us. Sometimes three to six commandos would ambush us on our travel road. Usually they use Claymore mines. In Vietnam, SEALs were called on to lie, cheat, and steal. They often broke the entire Ten Commandments in the course of a day's work. Yet SEAL operations were effective, and since Vietnam, the SEALs are recognized as a group that will fight fire with fire. Times have changed, but the lessons learned in Vietnam are still applied by today's Navy SEALs. Preparing for war in peacetime might create an expectation in the public's mind that technology alone will bring a victory with low casualties. But for those who must kill or be killed on the battlefield, war remains a deadly and personal business. With 144 countries accessible by sea, the SEALs find themselves at the center of the action. It's becoming very difficult to figure out where the lines are. We're sort of in a reactive mode in a lot of ways. You're at the ready, something happens, you respond to it. The main boat used for close-in platoon insertion and extraction is the rigid hull inflatable, or rib. Used on river and inland waterways, they're fast, they work well in low levels of water, and are designed exclusively for use by the SEAL teams. The rib is 33 feet long and has the ability to carry a full platoon. It rides low in the water, making it harder to detect on radar. It's powered by a jet propulsion drive and can absorb a bullet piercing its hull. SEALs remain unseen, but sometimes upon reaching their target destination, they come into direct contact with their enemy. Only their reflexes and training help them survive. difficult to prepare for war, it's difficult to maintain that level of preparedness for long periods of time. We've got to have real bullets, real ranges, and we've got to shoot real training scenarios in order to be confident. For every combat situation, SEALs rely on a shared memory, a memory that has taught them how to control fear and focus on the mission, no matter the circumstances. We have no problem keeping the edge of special operations. We treat every operation as if it were for real. That's the way we train, and that's the way we win.
This is the weapon of our enemies, the AK-47. It is the most prolific assault rifle in the world. You'll see this in just about every third world nation you might have to be employed to go and do a mission. A lot of people say these weapons are highly inaccurate and cheap, and that's pretty much true. But it doesn't take much to shoot a man at 100 yards with one of these, especially when it just won't quit. It works in sand, in mud, in dirt, in snow. And it's something to definitely be wary of if you're an American warrior, because this is one of the weapons that's most likely going to be shooting at you. No plan ever survives first contact with the enemy. Knowing the terrain they will operate in, anticipating situations they might find there, and training to react instinctively are as important to a SEAL platoon as carrying the right equipment. With a squad size of eight men, it is not technology that is going to save them in battle. In war, it's often the first side who spots the other who has the advantage. A SEAL platoon is not defined by numbers. Instead, it is a detailed knowledge of policies, procedures, systems, and weaponry that gives a SEAL platoon a force projection beyond its physical size. SEAL's vulnerability begins when their attacking force reaches the enemy's first line of defense. At this point, the friction of war begins to impinge upon the success of the battle. In a conventional battle, you accept a certain number of casualties. The fog of war will naturally create 5% casualties, maybe high 10% casualties or whatever. In the SEALs, their mindset is that any casualty is a result of somebody's mistake. They lose one man in a very small squad or platoon, it has a serious dent in their whole operation. In a gun battle, all team members are listening. They know that a lull in the firing means the enemy is reloading or that he might be regrouping. At the first sign of a lull, the team begins to fall back. Breaking contact and regaining unit cohesion is the first step to recovering the initiative. People might think sometimes that guys in the military are just a bunch of robots, just a bunch of non-thinkers, and that's wrong. Navy SEALs have to think on their feet. They have to move fast. They have to make their own decisions. Some other people or some other units might sit there and wait for someone to give them orders and tell them what to do. Well, in our line of work, that person who's telling you what to do can be shot, and you're going to have to take charge immediately yourself and accomplish that mission. The ability to execute a coordinated group movement during a firestorm of surprise, fear, and bullets is how they maintain group cohesion. You can't just go in there expecting to have a free-for-all. It takes a lot of restraint, and it takes a lot of awareness of your surroundings where you are able to watch for those danger zones so that uh, ultimately you don't get hurt. In a carefully orchestrated maneuver, the squad breaks contact by a series of fire and maneuver movements. Despite their array of weapons, SEAL platoons are not large enough to endure a drawn-out engagement. We don't have a lot of firepower. We have eight to 10 minutes of a sustained wall of lead going out there, and that's it. We've blown our nut, and it's time to get out of there. If we come across a large force, we're, we need to call in some, uh, some helos to get us out of there or some fast movers for some, some fire support. What we have to do on our missions is, is get in, 
and get out without being seen. And if we do leave a mark or have a direct action mission, we have to do it in such a way that we get out or get reinforcements real quickly because those guys are, are real vulnerable in enemy territory. Extracting by helicopter can be a delicate operation. Over time, the frictions of war work only against the SEALs. If the landing zone is hot, the helicopter becomes vulnerable before it lands. Speed is essential, regardless of the enemy's reactions. The longer an engagement continues, the more likely the outcome will be negatively affected. In a SEAL platoon, the weapon choice is based on the individual's preference. Some guys are much better suited to carrying an M60 light machine gun. Other guys would rather carry a 727 carbine with a 203 on it. Some are really good long range shots and they're best employed carrying an M14 rifle. One of the things that makes us so effective is that we have such a wide variety of weapons to choose from for the different missions that we have to accomplish. This is the Navy SEAL's version of the M16 rifle, the Colt 727 carbine. It provides a SEAL platoon with an intermediate range assault rifle that is lightweight and accurate out to 400 yards. We'll use this firearm here for close quarter battle purposes and just about the whole spectrum of Navy SEAL missions. It's best employed at the closer and intermediate ranges. The round it fires is fairly devastating. Some of the missions we do require us to fast rope out of helicopters, jump out of fixed wing or rotary wing aircraft. We can repel with this weapon. It's great in a situation that requires us to use a rifle that's not gonna be in the way, that's very short and manageable. Real world missions require real world solutions. Each SEAL platoon must make careful and detailed choices when deciding what equipment to use for each mission. Weather, geography, and location of the target can make choosing the right arms a critical factor for success. This is the MP5 Navy model submachine gun. It's a recoil-operated weapon firing from a roller-locking bolt. It's air-cooled, and it utilizes a 30-round magazine. The Navy SEALs use this weapon for close quarter battle. Being a submachine gun, it's light and handy. You'll see this weapon employed by anti-terrorists and special reaction teams all around the world. When we enter a structure with this and we spot our adversaries, there's two ways we can take them out with this weapon. One is the double tap. I put two shots to the center mass. If he doesn't drop, another one right to the head. Or you can be trained to burst fire this weapon, where you will fire a controlled three-round burst to the center mass. The SEALs carry some of the most sophisticated firepower in the armed forces, but any weapon can malfunction. For a backup, most SEALs carry a 9mm pistol as their secondary weapon. We use handguns primarily as a secondary weapon. Our submachine gun, our assault rifle, or our light machine gun would be our primary weapon. If that weapon were to go down, we'd be able to instantly employ the handgun to finish off the enemy. Being a 9mm, some people might say, well, it's only a 9mm, it won't do anything. But when I put two rounds through your heart and one through your head, you won't know the difference. And neither will the enemy. SEALs are known for their connection to the sea, but most frogmen would rather ride than swim to and from a target. Seahawk helicopters combine speed and range to move a SEAL platoon quickly, increasing their ability to insert or extract their force before their target can react. The helicopter is both vulnerable and deadly. In the hands of a talented pilot and crew, 
It's a powerful killing machine. Equipped with armor plating and 20 millimeter guns that operate using electric motors, a pair of Seahawk helicopters can insert up to a full platoon of 16 men and provide a withering covering fire that unleashes an attack of 4,000 rounds per minute on an area the size of two football fields. The Seahawk is vulnerable to concentrated ground fire, but was never intended for an aerial assault on an armed target. Like their sealed cargo, the Seahawks rely on speed and surprise to deliver and recover their payloads. Being able to insert and extract themselves in a variety of circumstances gives the SEALs flexibility in choosing their attack and extract plans. Each operator knows that by itself, a weapon is not going to win a fight. With over 50 years of experience working underwater, on land, and in the air, the SEALs have embraced new technology, but resist the obvious temptation to use it as a replacement for the human factors they believe are necessary for success in wartime. Navy SEAL doctrine, it's not about going in there and killing an individual. It's mostly about gathering information that would lead another SEAL force or another uh, American military force to conduct a mission that would benefit the outcome of the conflict. In the 21st century, information is power. Possessing the military capability to gather intelligence often provides an alternative for expanding and shaping the different foreign policy options of the United States. There's been co-mingling of the SEAL forces and the CIA. It's called cheap dipping, where you may see more of it is in the drug war in the future. You may see Navy SEALs more involved in riverine operations. In fact, they're doing a lot of training of that in, in uh, South America and Central America. And some of those might get sheep dipped to the CIA. In wartime, the success of a military operation is judged solely on the achievement of the mission objectives. The cost in lives, although regrettable, lies within the realm of the necessary. Low-intensity conflict and other doctrinal definitions of conflict all tend to remove the human cost from the immediacy of war. But not in the special operations community. For those soldiers, every bullet is personal. We've always tried to enhance our straightforward activities by gathering intelligence, uh, whatever it took behind the enemy lines. That kind of is changing its direction, I think. For one thing, there's no lines anymore. I don't want to spend longer than two minutes here. For those who define these regional actions as conflicts other than war, the threats to the world's economic and social stability from technology transfer, espionage, and terrorist drug trafficking are monumental. Navy SEALs and their special boat units have the capability to provide a limited and controlled military response to certain situations not worthy of a full-scale military action. SEAL operations might require clandestine, covert, or low-visibility tactics supported by political oversight from the national level. One of the most important missions is war on terrorism. When the SEALs train for intelligence gathering missions, they enter enemy territory and carefully search the target area. Title on. The enemy might be a country, a drug smuggler, or an arms trafficker. Any information they find can help them piece together a big picture of enemy activity. We recovered one map, one notebook, everyone aboard the craft is deceased over. 
One of the advantages of special operations is getting to the objective as fast as possible. Delay creates vulnerability. With our special ops aviation, we have the ability to move around our forces, which are relatively small, and present a smaller signature and can get in and out of situations. Larger forces don't have that capability. That's one of the advantages of special operations forces. Working in small units and moving stealthily in the air and on the ground and in the sea, accomplishing our mission without detection. Popular films and books often glamorize fictional heroes of the special forces as misunderstood individuals, renegade killing machines living outside the rules of military conduct and discipline. The uh, Rambo mystique is a real problem. I think it has been generated by our exposure to the press. In the days when I joined the SEAL team, you wouldn't even let a photographer take your picture. Our mystique was based not on bragging about our capabilities, but from precluding anybody from finding out what our capabilities were. While it is true that every SEAL dreams of combat, their doctrine isn't about anger or recklessness. Instead, it is a crucial combination of observation, invisibility, and controlled violence. What separates a Navy SEAL or any other special operations force from another soldier is not so much his physical capability, but the mental capability, whether he can handle the mental stress, whether he can think on his feet, think innovatively, and even think creatively as a warrior versus the traditional military mindset, which is to follow orders. Navy SEALs are unconventional soldiers. They have to be. They are often the first ones to infiltrate enemy territory to collect intelligence. Sniper teams can also clear the area of anything or anyone who may threaten the outcome of their mission. Undetected, they can establish the initiative, choosing the moment and location for the fight, theoretically striking at the enemy's weakest point. Becoming a sniper is one of the most sought-after jobs within the SEAL units, with some of the most exacting qualifications. Fifty caliber sniper rifles are becoming the wave of the future for special operations. With these types of firearms, we don't need to send a demolition team in. We can simply stand off from the target and shoot it. A sniper is an expert with a rifle, surgically precise, capable of hitting a target in exactly the same place over and over again from a distance of almost three quarters of a mile away. But a sniper must be more than a good shot. He must be extremely patient. In a real-world situation, snipers and their spotters spend hours, days, and weeks lying in wait. They call it stalking. Sometimes it takes an entire day for these teams to move less than a few hundred yards. In the SEAL teams, we have the best trained snipers in the military. Our snipers do a lot more than just shoot. They're our forward observers. They're our eyes and ears. Before we go out on a mission, we'll send snipers in to observe the target, to do reconnaissance. That way we can ensure 100% probability of a successful mission when we call the platoon in. 
snipers can stand off and clean off a target, forcing enemy soldiers to take cover or flee while the rest of the SEAL team can take positions on the target and perform their mission. This keeps the enemy off balance, a tactic that works well for small units. 90% of a sniper's job is collecting intel. 10% is being a surgeon with bullets. Everybody around me is counting on me to make the shot go exactly where I want it to go every time. You've got to control your breathing. Everyone knows what happens when they get excited. They might start to shake, they breathe heavier, your heart rate goes up. You've got to have control over that. You've got a lot of tunnel vision just looking through a 16 power scope, right? You can't see a whole lot, you're looking in a small area. But you also find yourself just focusing on one thing. For instance, the guy you just shot. There's some kind of morbid fascination where you want to go back and look at him. And you, you've got to pull yourself back from those effects of the adrenaline so you're not wasting your time looking at someone who's already dead. He's not a threat anymore. You gotta look for the new threat, address it, and neutralize it. The SEALs will attack a target from several different directions at once. Using the sniper team to cover them, a SEAL squad increases its ability to get in close without being detected or suffering casualties. Once inside the target area, the squad can perform their mission while being protected by the sniper team. For secret intelligence operations that have no clearly defined battle lines or requirement for a conventional military deployment, the SEALs remain an important weapon for American policymakers. Intensive training and an absolute confidence in each team member are only two of the primary necessities for successfully completing a SEAL mission. The third is secrecy. Moving in enemy territory while remaining undetected is a life and death challenge for every SEAL patrol. Doing it in broad daylight while attempting to locate and rescue a downed pilot and then escape without detection could be a situation SEALs find themselves in without warning. The SEALs realize the chances for a successful rescue decrease with each passing minute. The longer the pilot is on the ground, the less chance they have for a successful rescue. Although they know his position is nearby, so are potential enemies. Get your hands on your head. Turn around. Lie down, face down. Down. What's the word of the day? No. What's the number of the day? Three. Do you have any weapons on you? No. Are you injured in any way? No. Okay. To protect themselves, the SEAL rescuers must approach the victim as if he might be hostile. It is important that the victim be disarmed and evaluated quickly. Immediate extract of LZ Delta. How copy? I'm David. I'll be handling you. Do as I say. Follow me. Don't try to run if anything happens. Stay calm and listen to me.
We operate in very small numbers and in very sensitive military operations where if uh, it becomes known what we're doing, we can harm the men who are participating in the operation, or to some degree, we might be bringing embarrassment upon the United States of America. That's a hole in the front so you can see. Here's a hat, put that on. Have you heard or seen any other people in the area besides us? No, no. We get on a helicopter now. Let's go. Getting out of the area once the victim has been secured is not easy. In thick woods and steep terrain, walking is too slow. There is always the potential for ambush. Extraction with rescued hostages must be dynamic. to get men off the ground quickly is employing a device called the spy rig. The special purpose insertion and extraction rig is a line dropped from a helicopter hovering overhead. The men on the ground wear harnesses and attach themselves two at a time to the line. Once all the men are tied in, the helicopter lifts up vertically until the load can clear any obstacles. The spy rig is hazardous, but a proven and trusted method for extracting seals from difficult terrain. CQB is a mission that a SEAL platoon would really like to do. First of all, we don't like third world terrorists, and we basically live to terminate them and to end their fetid existence on this planet. You have not been very responsive. You need to answer more questions. Most missions are done at night. The platoon is dropped off close to their target, but not close enough to alarm guards or enemy troops. The approach may last a few minutes. More time than that, and detection might mean the SEAL team will abort its primary mission. Secrecy of intent, secrecy of insertion, secrecy from their own families is the price these men pay to execute a direct action mission. Look at it. That radio was in your survival bag. You tell me it's not yours? Look up! Look up! When a SEAL platoon is called for a mission, all the members are put into total isolation to help ensure the security of the operation. They can remain isolated for hours, days, even weeks before learning where or when they are going. Once they have a target and a full mission profile, each platoon member, regardless of his rank, is included in the planning process. There's respect for the officers, but there's also a respect the other direction from the officers to the men. And in some cases, things demanding special skills, an enlisted man who is the best diver or navigator underwater will be in charge of an operation and an officer will be subordinate to him during that operation. Each man's movements are well rehearsed. Each SEAL is familiar with the other men's position and movements. The men communicate by touch. Each man has practiced CQC raids a thousand times. Inside a building, the team will move in a formation called a train. This allows them to leapfrog around each other and provide constant cover in all directions in case someone unexpectedly comes out of a door or hallway. You will die here! Imagine yourself stacked outside the door of a foreign embassy. Inside, terrorists have just taken hostage some American dignitaries. What are you doing here? You have no friends. You'll never be out there to No one cares about you. Now you better start answering these questions. Help me answer my questions. All of a sudden, the breacher charges go off. The door is open. You're going into the room at a high rate of speed. The first thing you see is the terrorist reaching for his AK-47. Too late. He's in your sights. You just fired a quick double tap into his chest and a third shot into his head. He's out of the picture. Your hands flat. Clear left. All clear. All clear. Hostage. Hostage. Keep your head down. Put your hands up. 
I would tell the general public that if you expect us to do things well, then don't ask us to expose how we do them. Don't have the press following us around. The bad guys watch TV just like everybody else. Get up slow. Put up, put up. Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Better, better, over. Better, standing by for extraction. I mark you, identify a hell copy, over. Firehawk, this is better. Roger that, out. security continues to provoke internal debate in the teams. But it's not the weapons or even tactics that make the SEALs a dangerous force to their enemies. Tactics and weapons are regularly discussed in a wide variety of media. The SEALs' main advantage over their opponents remains in their ability to conceal the time and place of their attack. Unconventional warfare, as practiced by the U.S. Navy SEALs, remains a controversial subject in public discussions. Despite a combat heritage dating back to the French Indian War, the American military establishment has never been comfortable with the presence of unorthodox forces within its ranks. More important, perhaps, was the perception that SEAL methods of sabotage, surprise attacks, and hit-and-run ambush that sometimes included civilian targets, were not the American way to do battle. This belief has often obscured the value of their unconventional missions, frequently assignments that no other unit would accept. The Pentagon has never really understood how to use not only the Navy SEALs, but all special operations forces. It's kind of ironic. Our nation's military was born as a guerrilla force at Lexington and Concord, but it, it evolved into a very, very conventional army. Unconventional forces by nature are not subject to a strict, rigid chain of command. They are trained to go out and operate on their own. You want guys that are switched on, that have attention to detail, self-starters, motivated. In this community, uh, there is only one reputation you want to have, and that is the reputation as an operator. Everything else, as far as I'm concerned, is a liability. An operator is an asset. That's a man who seeks after harm's way. SEALs are descended from a heritage of US Navy, British, and Italian combat swimmers. Although this organization is often described as among the finest of the modern commando units, their reputation as elite troops is part of a double-edged sword. SEALs are not infallible. As disciplined and well-trained as they are, the practical nature of their operations is constantly being defined. Where on the one hand, we are given a lot of credit for being creative. That independence, some people will, will see that as these guys are loose cannons. We are very well disciplined, uh, though it expresses itself in a different way than it does in the Marine Corps or in the Army. Practicing for a football game day after day after day, sooner or later, you want to get the ball. Whether or not that's a good thing, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe it's something we shouldn't look forward to. The secret to any special operations success is basic. Arrive on the target quickly and establish relative superiority. Simply put, take the advantage during the pivotal moment in battle. This is no easy task for a small attacking force like the SEALs. For them, the ability to sustain relative superiority often comes down to moral factors, courage, intellect, boldness, and perseverance. Everybody likes a hero. This nation runs on heroism, dynamic leadership, and all that sort of stuff, and it's our heritage. And uh, uh, those that don't like it, <laughs> they're probably cowards. 
Imagine a small 16-man force going in and shooting a Scud missile launcher. You might be scared to do that. We've got to be tough. We've got to be angry at the enemy to accomplish these missions. We've got to plan with the utmost in precision to accomplish this. I believe and I know in my heart that we are the most highly skilled group of warriors in the world. And we are dedicated to accomplishing that mission.